Hello, uh, we'll be talking about forest protection today or um, forest pests, or you could say um, insects, disease, and natural disturbances that affect the forest. All of those different titles would work for what we're going to talk about today. So let's start off with what is a pest. So a pest is defined as uh, an organism that damages or interferes with desirable plants in our fields and orchards, landscapes, wildlands, it, or it damages homes or structures. It could impact human or animal health. It could transmit disease, or it could just be a nuisance. So you got things like plants, um, vertebrates, uh, invertebrates, nematodes, pathogens that can cause disease or unwanted um, um, organisms that could cause water quality issues or anim animal life problems or hurt any part of the ecosystem. So, I mean, we could be talking about weeds, we can talk, be talking about birds, rodents, mammals, insects, ticks, mites, snails, bacteria, viruses, uh, funguses, um, all sorts of different things. And we're going to kind of pick a few to focus on today that are really affecting the forestry industry. So one thing to remember is that pests are natural um, sometimes. Sometimes they are exotic species, so sometimes they're uh, non-native to a specific area. And um, we even have a specific term, which is invasive species, which is a, a living organism that is not native to an area and causes harm. So um, we can have exotic species in an area, and those ones aren't causing harm to the uh, ecosystem. But if you have a non-native species and it's causing harm to the ecosystem, then that's an invasive species. And so you can have natural pests. Um, they can, they're usually in low numbers and they're part of the balance of the ecosystem, but sometimes you can have these invasive pests as well. And they, they usually cause a much bigger problem. Um, the biggest, or one of the, the big reasons why pests are becoming such a problem and a much bigger issue these days is ecosystem simplification. You've got um, large numbers of the same plants or the same species, and you've got um, a much sim more simplified food web. You have less biodiversity around, and that um, has allowed these pests um, to, to get into larger numbers because they're not really able to be kept in the lower numbers that that works really well for them within the ecosystem boundaries. So on this page right here, hopefully you're following along with the PDF slide. So if you are, you can pause the video here, click on the link, and then um, watch a video about forest health. So one thing to think about is this idea of invasive uh, pests and plants. And there's a, a list here on the bottom right that I've linked in here. So um, there's 741 million acres of forest land and about 40% of it shows in um, one or more invasive species. And you can see that in the southeast, we got quite a bit of uh, intensity in terms of um, problems with invasive species. And so it's, when you think about 40% of the land, so, you know, roughly let's call it 300 million acres. 300 million acres have invasive species on them or some sort of problematic species on them. That's a big big issue and and that's going to really kind of come to a head and try try and um, figure out how to properly manage an area and um, one thing I also like to point out is um, the state of Hawaii if you look at Hawaii there the whole thing is in that orange zone and there's no pe um, no piece of Hawaii that's not in that orange and um, that's actually why movies uh, go and film in Hawaii a lot because there's so many invasive species in Hawaii that it can look like it's anywhere because there's all sorts of different uh, species growing there. And more than likely that's happened because of Hawaii's location and being that bridge between Asia and the United States. So here's just a couple of species uh, to focus on. 
One is Chinese tallow tree, which you can see by this map on the right uh, we have in California, and I have uh, in my yard. I'm hoping to get rid of it soon enough, uh, but it's an invasive species, sometimes called popcorn tree because of the way uh, it fruits, uh, but it's, a, it's an invasive species that will colonize and take over areas and, and not allow for the native vegetation to, to come up in its place. Another big one that's uh, pretty problematic is kudzu. Now you can see kudzu is much more problematic in the southeast, but there are a couple spots in Oregon where it's problematic as well. And if you look at this picture on the left, everything there that's covered up in that green, that is all kudzu covering all of that. And that sort of ecosystem simplification can really cause problems and really cause an ecosystem to, to suffer. So um, looking at tree mortality, specifically in 2015, there was 6 million acres of tree mortality due to insects and disease. And of that 6 million acres, 20% um, of it or one-fifth of it was from mountain pine beetle. Now, mountain pine beetle, going back to what we talked about with pests at the beginning of the lecture, is a natural pest. It's something that should be around in the um, in the in that area in the western U.S. However, it it's not it's not invasive. It's there, but it's usually kept in low numbers, and it's usually cold enough that when um, the winters come around. So the beetles die off and they're kept in very low numbers. But the problem is that with climate change and with um, also with the lack of fire in some of these areas, the mountain pine beetle isn't disappearing in the numbers that it, it should be and instead is multiplying in much greater numbers. So uh, this graphic right here, uh, we're looking at the western United States and you can see tree mortality from fire on the left and tree mortality from bark beetles and you can see there's much much more intensity um, from bark beetles and especially in the Sierra Nevada we've had a problem with drought and then drought stressing out the trees and bringing in uh, bark beetles which has really led to a lot of tree mortality in the in the Sierra Nevadas. So one of the the big things to always remember when we're talking about this idea of insects or really just this overall term of a forest pest is that prevention is the first and most cost effective line of defense against forest pests. The idea that if you can stop the problem before it happens, that's, that's the really important thing that you want to do. You want to have it to where you don't have a problem to begin with. So insects, why are insects a problem? Well, insects make up 90% of the species in the animal world. So they're the majority of what's out there anyway. So more than likely, because of the high numbers that they have and the fact that there are so many of them, some of them are probably gonna cause a problem. So insects destroy more trees each year than any other single factor. It's not fires, it's not um, drought, it's not, any, it's not human beings, it's not any of that, it's insects. Um, they can disfigure trees, they can stunt growth, they can create fire hazards, they can increase stress, and they can make problems worse. And the reasons for that is they've got um, highly useful adaptations. They're tiny, so they're, they're hidden easily. they got huge populations, so they don't need a lot of food because they are so small. They, they, a lot of them can feed in the same exact place, so that reduces some, um, some intraspecific competition. And then um, they, they can fly during their reproductive period. So that gives them enormous reproductive potential to where they can keep multiplying, keep multiplying, keep multiplying. And soon they have these huge numbers to where you have no idea what to do with, with them. It's, um, it's actually really fascinating when you think about it, the actual number of insects there are out there because it's millions and billions and, and trillions. It's, it's really impressive. In terms of insects popula populations, there's two two big stages to think about. So you've got the endemic stage where they're present in their normal numbers and they're doing little to no damage to trees. That's that's the endemic stage. The epidemic stage, 
That's when the population reaches a point where the annual tree losses due to insects in the forest are exceeding the annual growth in the forest. So if you, so when you're you're losing tree, basically you're you're having trees come down from insects, but the growth that you're getting back in the forest isn't enough to keep up with that. That's when it's considered to be an epidemic. Um, the the reproductive potential of a uh, of an insect we're going to define that as the ability of an insect to multiply in the absence of any control and then when we come up with um, we want we want environmental resistance to these populations that's kind of the thing that we're striving for and when we say environmental resistance we're saying the force working against insects reaching huge proportions so basically well, when we think about it, we want to give the environment, we want to give the ecosystem some sort of resiliency, some sort of way to fight off the insects, some sort of way to keep them in the endemic stage and keep them out of the epidemic stage. Because we're never going to get rid of insects, nor would we want to, because they are part of the ecosystem and they're, they're part of how it functions. Now, if it's an invasive species, that's a different story. But in terms of our natural pests, they're fine in their normal numbers. They're problematic if it ever gets to the epidemic stage like it has for bark beetles. So we have um, seven categories of destructive insects. We've got beetles, butterflies, wasps, flies, scale insects or aphids, bugs, and termites. And these are their uh, orders in terms of where they fall. Uh, classification wise and then they actually have all uh, differences in their wings I don't expect you guys to know the differences in the wings no big deal on that I would rather you focus on um, how they fit into um, which bugs fit into these different categories um, that I'm about to go into and how do those categories differ because when we when I think of destructive insects, I really would rather rather than looking at their wing characteristics, I want to classify them in how they um, how they interact with the forest and how they how they cause damage to the forest. So the first two we're going to focus on are sucking insects and defoliators. So with sucking insects, they're going to attack both the foliage and the stem, and they have sucking mouth parts. So they basically pierce the tissue. Of the leaves pierce the tissue of the of the stem and they're sucking out um, tree sap from the from the stem and they're sucking out uh, chlorophyll from the tissues of the leaves so you've got aphids and cicadas that fall into this category uh, the damage from them is usually not serious uh, I've seen plenty of cicadas out in the woods they don't really cause that much of an issue um, so control is is not really needed uh, usually for sucking insects. In terms of defoliators, they feed on the needles and leaves of trees. Um, caterpillars are, are a perfect example of a defoliator. They've got chewing mouth parts. They can chew up needles or they can eat the chlorophyll. Uh, two good examples of this are the spruce budworm and the Douglas fir tussock moth, who um, the two of them combined in 2015 ate up 4 million acres of trees. And uh, control for defoliators is usually a large scale operation because once you have the, the defoliators, um, just like this example here, 4 million acres, that's a lot of control that you're going to have to put out there. And so it's going to be kind of a large scale operation. So here's uh, kind of some pictures of that. So we've got the spruce budworm uh, life cycle here on the left. We can see uh, on the right there some uh, animals attacking the le the tissues and the leaves, and then we've got the uh, the Douglas fir uh, tussock moth up on the top right. And when we say a large scale operation, one of the ways that you're going to be able to uh, do that is through aerial spraying and um, just having to do to cover um, hundreds or thousands of acres in one go the only way to do that is going to be by um, spraying chemicals and spraying them from the air now that um, is going to be expensive it's going to be hard to accomplish and make effective and it's going to be um, 
possibly hazardous to the environment. So that's why going back a few slides, we said prevention is the best way to avoid any problems. So some uh, other insects that we really want to focus on another group is the bark beetles and we're gonna we're gonna focus in on them because they're they're extremely important in terms of our local area with um, the problems that they've had uh, in the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, here on this slide I've put uh, a couple different uh, links. There's one that talks about the problems in the Sierra Nevada specifically and then the second link is um, it's an ArcGIS storyboard that kind of shows you pictures and some information about uh, what's going on using GIS maps. And so bark beetles are much more destructive than defoliators and they're not controllable in large populations by aerial spraying. So you can't even, um, even if we wanted to use the aerial spraying, it's not going to do it because they're, they're inside the trees. So we can't really just um, spray and go get them like with the defoliators we see they'll be out on the leaves and all that so you can you can get them with an aerial spray but the bark beetles are inside underneath the bark so it's going to take a different uh, method of control to get them uh, they usually spend most of their life in dead and dying bark of trees and they're usually conifer trees and so how how does it work and how do they become a problem so usually there's a pioneer or a few pioneers um, who are going out they find a dead tree, they send out an attractive, so they send out this pheromone, and then all of a sudden all the other ones are like, oh, there's a dead tree, let's go get it. And then you can have thousands of insects brought to one specific tree. Um, the tree's going to try and pitch out for defense, meaning that's going to take the sap and, and try and plug the hole where the, the bugs are going to come in, but um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, especially if there's thousands of them coming to the same tree. Um, in order to try and stop bark beetles, you really have to try some direct attack methods. So you can fell, fell the, the trees that are dead, dead and dying. You can, uh, do some prescribed burning. You can do some sun curing, which is, uh, basically you open up the canopy and let the sun come in and hit them because they can't handle the, uh, the, the solar radiation. Uh, and then the other thing is ground spraying. So actually um, getting there and spraying the trees themselves, that would work. It's not as, it's not effective from the air. So here is the mountain pine beetle, Dendroctinus ponderosae. There's a picture of one there on the left, and on the right here. Um, you can see Rocky Mountain National Park, what it looked like in 2005, and then four years later with all that brown there. It's all dead, dead, and dying trees, uh, all from mountain pine beetle. And on the top right here, we have the range of the mountain pine beetle, so much of the western United States and western Canada. And the thing to remember as we look at this picture on the right and see all the, those brown, and dead trees is that this is a natural pest. This is a pest that is fine in lower numbers, but with climate change, with a lack of fires, lack of spraying herbicides, lack of basically any sort of control for this pest, this pest has reached the epidemic stage and we're losing trees at a rapid rate. So this uh, graphic on the left for Rocky Mountain National Park, and the reason I keep using it is one, it's an area that's been hard hit by mountain pine beetle, but also I worked a summer at Rocky Mountain National Park, so I've, I've been to this area. And you can see in 2002, just very small uh, areas of bark beetle damage. And that's what you would kind of look at and say, well, that's, that's typical um, for this area. And then you look at 2002 to 2011 when bark beetles have reached this epidemic stage and you can see how much damage they've done. And, you know, you're talking about half of that area that's, that is affected by bark beetle damage. And it is a lot of acres. And I, I cannot tell you because I've driven past these areas and just seen swath after swath after swath of forest of just brown trees and they're not coming back and so they're going to get removed somehow and that 
also then leads to this idea of higher fire damage, higher susceptibility to other disease and pathogens, and it's really a, a concern as to what is going to happen to these forests. Specifically here in the Sierra Nevadas, we're having the same issue that they're seeing uh, up in the Rocky Mountains. So because of the drought that we've had for so long it, that um, we, we had a lot of drought stressed trees in the in the Sierras. And then what happened is the bark beetles found those trees that were dying a little bit and they worked their way in. And now they have they've um, just decimated the Sierras. So during the drought, 102 million Sierra Nevada trees died from bark beetle attacks or drought and 68 million trees alone in 2016. Um, but you can see though, in 2016, 2017, we got some rainfall and all of a sudden those trees, the, the other trees that were stressed out aren't stressed out anymore. And now the bark beetles don't have anywhere to go. So it really is, in, you know, if we're going to have climatic variation, we need to be able to make sure that our pests are under control. So a lot of that goes into ideas of climate change. A lot of that goes into making sure we're properly monitoring and um, managing these populations. And just a lot of it really comes down to what we're doing here in this class, which is learning how to understand these species so that we don't suffer problems from them later on. So another bark beetle uh, to be uh, concerned about is the red bay ambrosia beetle. And you'll see right here I've got hashtag save the guac and on the bottom right there is a hyperlink uh, because this tree, this um, bug um, help spread laurel wilt, which is something that affects um, trees in the laurel family. And one of those trees is avocados. And so this is actually a huge problem with the uh, avocados in Florida. And so this, this animal carries the laurel wilt um, disease and can decimate uh, those trees. So it, when we look here in the southeast, uh, specifically Florida and um, the southeastern part of Georgia and the south half of South Carolina, you can see uh, that there's quite a bit of laurel wilt disease being spread out throughout a lot of these counties. And so it's, it's problematic in terms of trying to make sure that the, that the avocados, which a lot of people really like, as well as these other laurel trees, don't get decimated by this by this beetle and by, by laurel wilt disease. So we also have um, five more groups of destructive insects. We've got wood borers, which usually come, uh, the damage comes after the tree is felled and the best, best method of control is to keep wood dry and elevated off the ground. You've got terminal feeders that affect seedlings and saplings. So they're, they're out there trying to hit the terminal. So the, the terminal bud, the top of the tree and, and not really the opposite of it, but at the opposite end of the tree are the root feeders, which are going to feed, feed on the roots, the bottom part of the tree. So you got termites, grubs, uh, weevils, and wireworms are all root feeders. Uh, you got gall makers. So they, a gall is an abnormal growth on leaves or twigs by mechanical irritation or by chemical stimulation. And so valley oak, um, which we have some on campus and some growing within this um, in our Central Valley area, that's something that um, has a lot of galls on it due to a wasp. And then you also have seed insects, which are de very destructive in seed orchards, and they destroy the trees before they can germinate. And um, if we don't know what germinate, mean, germinate means, it means to grow after a uh, dormant period. So they even destroy the tree before the tree can grow. So that's um, five other destructive insects. So um, an example of a wood borer would be the emerald ash borer. And so you can see on the right here the signs and symptoms of having emerald ash borer. You start with some crown decline. You get some epicormic shoots, which are um, like small branches coming out of the stem of the tree. You'll get some bark split. You'll get some exit holes. 
uh, specifically D-shaped exit holes. And if you look at the insect in uh, number nine, you can see why it's a D-shaped exit hole. You'll get the bark beetle galleries, the S-shaped galleries. You'll get um, eggs, larva, and then the adults themselves. And, um, you know, you, you think, okay, well, so it's an ash borer, so it's ash trees that it's affecting. So what's, what are the uses of ash trees or where do, where do we see ash trees? Well, one place that this is having an effect on is actually baseball because, um, ash is one of the main, uh, woods that baseball bats are made out of so this has actually been a real problem for the the baseball bat industry among others so here's a map showing um, percentage of trees where emerald ash borer is a problem it's becoming a real problem in the great plains on the right here is um, some examples of where uh, emerald ash borer could find its way into the into a tree and over 70 million trees have been killed. Um, you've got, there are 8.7 billion ash trees in North America, but you've got over 70 million already um, been killed due to emerald ash borer. So that's quite a big chunk of the population. Uh, right here, if you click on this link, It'll take you um, to where it explains uh, the valley oak trees and the, the oak galls made from uh, a wasp and how um, it's really actually not hurting the oak tree itself, but it is something that is on there. So it's, and it's something you can see um, on campus very easily. A lot of people look at it and they think it's the fruit from the tree, but it's a, it's a oak tree. So the fruit's an acorn and so it's just it's it's an interesting thing to read up about so how do we manage insects or how, how are we going to deal with them and the problems that they create so the first way we're going to do it is through silvicultural techniques or silvicultural controls so we want to create an unviable unfavorable environment for them and a, create a favorable environment for their predators so we can use thinnings, we can use sanitation cuts. Um, when we cut down trees, we can submerge logs uh, in, in ponds or lakes. We can, um, when we have our cut wood on the ground, we can use a sprinkler system to keep it wet. Um, by keeping a forest mosaic, by pile and burning slash, by debarking logs, by removing high-risk trees, by minimizing log damage, by regulating age classes, by maintaining proper densities, by avoiding soil disturbance, by basically trying to make the forest as um, environmentally resistant as we can make it to whatever pest we're dealing with. Uh, one of the ways you can do that um, just basically is that if you're going to be somebody who uses firewood at your house or at your campsite or wherever, you're, you need to buy firewood where you're going to burn it because you don't know what's in that wood and you don't want to bring any sort of pest from somewhere else and have it uh, now end up in that area. They think that's how, um, or it's been proven that that's how uh, some of these species have spread from place to place is by even something as simple as where do you buy your firewood. Biological controls are our second uh, method of controls so um, or second category of controls so you're going to encourage the enemies um, of of whatever pest you're dealing with or perhaps disrupt their e uh, reproductive or growth process um, what can be used as biological controls uh, fungi bacteria viruses predatory and parasitic organisms um, the problem with this is this is how um, we've also ended up with some exotic and invasive species uh, in this area because of bringing them in to try and uh, work as a biological control. And then the big problem with those species is that we don't have a uh, control for them. So if they get out of control, then it's really problematic. Um, another good way to to get rid of some species 
is through birds. Birds love to eat insects. Uh, in one summer, uh, a bird population reduced the spruce bur budworm by 72%. And, and I'd say another way you could do it is intraspecific competition. So um, create uh, controls to where it's um, problematic that, that they're um, there in such big numbers and that they end up fighting each other instead of damaging the environment. Our last category of controls is chemical controls. This is the most direct form of control. As we mentioned before, it's the most expensive and then it can be the most controversial depending on um, how it affects the environment. Uh, we have insecticides. Insecticides are emergency treatments designed to reduce damage, not to eradicate a population. And our insecticides are categorized by how the poison enters the, the body. So you can either have a stomach poison a contact poison, or a fumigant. Uh, our pesticides are classified according to their chemical makeup. So you can have inorganic poisons, you can have chlorinated hydrocarbons, you can have carbamates, organophosphates, and natural plant pot products. Uh, the pesticides, um, the other, so we've got insecticides, we've got pesticides, and then we also can have systemic toxic chemicals where they're applied to the soil so you put them into the soil, and then when they're in the soil, they're taken up by the tree, and then the pest that's affecting the tree then takes it in that way. So it's systemic. It works its way through the system and gets all the way to the pest. But the best way um, we can think of to, to manage pests and manage disease and insects within the forest is with an IPM, or an integrated uh, pest management system and that's an ecosystem based strategy that focuses on the long term prevention of pests or their damage through a combination of techniques. Um, a good example is using biological control, using habitat manipulation, modification of cultural practices and use of resistant varieties. So you can put all of that together and the reason for coming up with integrated pest management is the idea that we know pests are needed in the ecosystem and we know that we want to keep the ecosystem healthy and usually there's never one right answer it's always some sort of a combination of different answers so if that's the case then let's let's look at all the all the things that we're going to need let's combine all of these things together to really figure out what is what is necessary to to get it done and get it done right. Um, another big thing to remember with with IPM is that uh, the pesticides are on, are used only after monitoring indicates that they are needed according to established guidelines. We're not trying to use treatments if they're not beneficial to um, human health, the environment, and uh, the non-targeted organisms. We're only trying to get rid of the pests. We're not trying to create a nemesis effect and cause more problems than we had to begin with. So right here is just kind of an infographic on integrated pest management, um, talking about some of the tools involved, and then the, the basic steps of an integrated pest management identify the, the problem, monitor it, evaluate the situation, figure out um, is the pest causing damage, do we need to ask, or do we need to act, um, come up with some sort of a pre, um, prevention method, put it into action as to how we're going to, uh, to deal with this pest, and then continually monitor that, that problem and make sure that it's staying in balance. So how does IPM work? So it's really focused on the long-term prevention of pests damaging the, the ecosystem. You want to monitor and you want to correct pest identification and decide whether management is needed or not. And you want to combine your management approaches for greater effectiveness. So here's another example just 
of all the different things that could come in. Uh, some sort of a biological control, maybe a pheromone trap, maybe a mechanical trap, maybe a light trap, maybe some phytochemicals, maybe putting in a chemical resistant tree, all sorts of different things and find what works best for your pest. How many things do we need to combine in and what's the best way to stay on top of it? Because we're trying to avoid problems like this. So, um, some principles for IPM programs. So you want to have pest identification. You want to monitor and assess pest numbers and damage. You want to establish guidelines for when management will be needed. You want to prevent pest problems. You want to use a combination of biological, cultural, physical, and mechanical, and chemical uh, management tools. And then after action, you want to assess and monitor uh, the effect of your pest management. So we want to prevent the buildup of pests before they start. If we do get pests, we want to monitor those pests, and then we want to intervene when necessary. So in terms of disease, and remember disease are also uh, come into the category of forest pests, uh, we have a specific branch of forestry called forest pathology, which is the study of tree diseases. And when we're talking about a tree disease, or specifically a disease, we're talking about any disturbance or interruption in the process of nutrition or another growth process resulting in partial or complete stoppage of development or death. Um, with our tree diseases, uh, we're going to focus on three categories. We're going to focus on abiotic, biotic, and decline. So abiotic tree diseases are growth problems induced by poor soil conditions, um, which could come from a mineral deficiency, could come from drought, could come from um, change in temperature, um, could also come from uh, the issues of law of tolerance of um, the conditions changing to where the species can't handle it anymore. You can also have biotic diseases, which is the most important of these three categories of abiotic, biotic, and decline. Biotic is by far the most important of the three categories because these are diseases that can affect the leaves, the stem, and the roots. They can cause wood decay. A lot of them are caused by um, fungi. In fact, probably every stand of timber has some sort of a, a fungus, some sort of a fungi issue. Just some of them, uh, or the majority of them, it's not, it's in that endemic um, stage where it's not problematic. And then if you have decline, a disease that's causing decline, you more than likely have a combination of multiple abiotic and biotic factors. So our tree diseases um, that we that we have, we have heart rots, we got cankers, we got wilts and diebacks, we got blights, we got needle disease, we got stains and rots, we've got dwarf mistletoe, and we've got um, decline. Now um, we could go into detail about what each of those are, but I'd rather just show you some pictures of what these different things look like. So um, on the top left here, we've got, um, that's what happens with uh, sudden oak death. On the bottom right, you can see some heart rot, um, or sorry, on the bottom left, you can see some heart rot. Um, on the bottom right, you can see, um, this. that's what we call a canker. Um, on the top right, you can see some uh, needle blight. And then uh, the middle picture is what happens. Um, it's, a, it's part of the chestnut blight. And so uh, if you don't know about uh, chestnut trees, chestnut used to be the most populous tree uh, in the eastern United States. And then there was a chestnut blight that basically wiped out um, the majority of the population. Uh, and it basically decimated it and has not allowed that population to come back. And this is what that, that disease looks like. Uh, here on this picture, so uh, on the top left, you'll see some stain. That's some blue stain on a pine tree. It's a, it's a fungus. On the bottom left, that's what dwarf mistletoe looks like on a tree. Uh, in the in the middle, that when we talk about dieback, that's what it looks like. So notice how the green area is kind of um, you got a lot of branch sticking out, 
but you don't have it covered in leaves. That's what we call dieback when you see branches, but you you have leaves closer to the main uh, stem of the tree. On the top right, you see a um, a pathogen affecting the leaves and the tissue in the leaves, and then on the bottom left, you see a uh, fungus uh, in the in the tree. So one one disease I do want to focus on because it's a it's problematic here in California is uh, Phytophthora remorum, which is sudden oak death. It's a fungus. Um, it's a fungal problem in um, oak trees. And what's interesting to me about it is that um, it actually it's it's an ecosystem problem because you need it needs a foliar host and also a canker host. So uh, when you look here, it says, number one, that the spores of Phytophthora remorum are spread from a host to, uh, to it, the canker host by wind and rain. Then the spores are going to enter the canker host through the trunk. They're going to grow in that tree and cause that tree to die. So even so, the, the pathogen starts in this other tree. But then through wind or um, water, it's going to spread to another tree, and then that tree is going to die. But the, the foliar host isn't going to die from it. It's just, to me, it's very interesting to see a disease work that way, where it's multiple species necessary, but then one will die, but the other one will be fine. It's just it's fascinating. Our last category of um, pests and da um, damage that we're going to talk about is the idea of um, what we call forest damage. So you can have damage by mammals, so um, damage by large ungulate mammals, deers, elk, moose, um, whatever l other large animals, bears that you can have in the forest. You can also have some small mammal uh, damage as well. You can also have ma um, damage from domesticated animals. Um, you can also have damage from feral animals. So feral animals are animals that were once domesticated but are now out in the wild. Uh, there's a big problem with um, feral hogs throughout Texas and um, throughout the southeast and other places um, where they're just they're, they reproduce in such great numbers. They tear up areas and it, they're, they're a huge problem to have to deal with. Our other source of forest damage is going to be climatic elements. So the idea of lightning, tornado, hurricanes, any sort of um, weather event that can destroy our forest as well. So pictures here. So on the top left, um, that's a uh, a young buck, a young um, a young deer, and uh, next to the deer is a picture of what um, what people would call a a scrape or a buck rub where they're they're rubbing their antlers to get the velvet off of their antlers and they'll rub rub the tree uh, especially young uh, pine trees and ruin it that way uh, on the bottom left he, here you can see a chipmunk and kind of the the nest and the mess that they can create in the forest uh, on the bottom right that's beaver damage um, another small mammal that causes quite a bit of damage. Um, it's beavers are an important species, though we wouldn't want to get rid of all the beavers, but um, they can be they can be extremely problematic if it's your land that that the beaver is tearing up. And on the top right, that's also the idea of what an area looks like um, when it's healthy and on the bottom, and then what it looks like when it's been um, overgrazed by deer or other animals. And then this uh, slide here is all about feral hogs. So remember, feral means the idea that they were once domesticated, but now they're out in the wild. And you can see the large number. They can reproduce in large numbers, and they just cause huge problems. So imagine if on the left, if this is a field of seedlings, and they just tore up that huge area there. You can see on the bottom right uh, what they do to the forest floor. Um, they're not necessarily damaging the trees, but remember we've talked about the importance of the soil to the ecosystem and to the trees themselves. And if the soil is being torn up and, um, and damaged, 
then that's going to cause real problems for the ecosystem overall. This um, slide right here is just the idea of wind damage. Hurricane, um, strong windstorm, tornado. When you look at this, and this is something I've seen quite a bit of when I lived in the southeast after, after the hurricanes rolled through, is just huge amounts of forest land destroyed. And if you say to yourself, well, you know, they just need to go in there and harvest those trees. True. But if this happens over thousands of miles, then every single sawmill is going to be called up and say, hey, I need to get rid of these trees. And those sawmills are going to say, well, so does everybody else. So I'll take them, but I'm only going to give you this tiny amount of money for it, not the hundreds of thousand dollars you were expecting for it. And that can really affect some people's livelihoods. And also then if you're stuck like this top right picture shows with a bunch of um, what we would call punji sticks um, sticking out of the, the ground, there's not much you can do. Your area is destroyed. It's going to take a long time. You're going to have to just take a big money hit and kind of start that area over again. And if this is a natural area where you're not doing any active management, how long is it going to look like this before uh, before the ecosystem recovers. So the weather events can be, can be really damaging to a forest. And that's, that's my lecture for forest protection. So if you got any questions, please ask and I'll talk to you next time.